Hello and welcome to another system design video and in this video we'll be covering data partitioning and sharding which is a particular type of data partitioning. Now what is it and why might you need to do it? As traffic grows to your site your database might end up being the bottleneck as it gets overloaded with more requests and vertically scaling by upgrading the single database server to something more powerful starts to get very expensive. This is where sharding may help as breaking your big single logical database into multiple small databases means load is now distributed over multiple machines and the size of the database is more scalable as you can just add on another node to increase the size. So sharding can be implemented at both the application level or the database level and there are a number of options for both. Cassandra, HDFS, HBase and MongoDB are some really good examples of modern distributed databases which are natively sharded and Redis memcached are great in-memory databases where sharding would be implemented at the application level. So how would you go about partitioning the data? There are two ways you can partition the database horizontally and vertically. Vertical partitioning is where we split the data by columns or features. So we have a microblogging platform like Twitter. All the users will have certain information about them in the database, such as their tweets, their followers, their favorites. If this data was to get partitioned vertically, then we will store tweets in one database, followers in another, and favorites in another. This is quite simple, but if the user base grows, we might have to split the data of individual features up further, which is where sharding may come into play. Now sharding, a word given to horizontal partitioning, is where we split the data by rows. So say we have a group chat service like Slack, where all the messages are conveniently grouped by organization. Because of this, we can decide to put all messages for organization names starting with A in one database, B in another database, and C, where you get the point. A problem you might face with this is that you could end up with unbalanced servers because you can have 10 times more organization names starting with A than X. And even if you get that balance right, organizations in one database might use Slack a lot more than other organizations. So now you know what sharding is. How do you route operations to write and read data to and from your distributed database architecture? Two common ways to do this are algorithmic sharding or dynamic sharding. With algorithmic sharding, your application would be able to identify which database to call by the ID or the partition key and the sharding function. A simple sharding function you may already be familiar with from a previous video is using the hash function on the ID and then finding the modulus against the number of database servers you have, which points you to the database server to go to. One challenge you may face using this type of sharding strategy is redistributing the data when adding or removing servers. This is because if you add a new server and you use the simple sharding function example, a new server will change the sharding function, so most of the data will need moving. You can decrease the amount of data you need to redistribute by choosing a better sharding function, such as consistent hashing. More about this on another video. Memcache is a great example for using this sort of algorithmic sharding strategy where the routing is done in the application level. In dynamic sharding, you have a lookup service which holds the locations of all your entities. So all requests would need to go to this lookup service first and then use the partition key. The service will be able to identify which database will hold your data. A major problem with this strategy is that you will be introducing a single point of failure and caching or replicating the lookup service can be very risky because the replica could get out of sync which means you'll be routing write requests to the wrong database which results in undiscoverable data. Fortunately though there are various high consistency solutions out there as there are many databases that use this strategy such as MongoDB which uses a config server to store this information and HDFS uses the name node to store file system metadata. Although sharding can improve your overloaded single server, it also brings problems that need to be taken into consideration. So problems we've briefly highlighted are shard allocation imbalance where data is not spread evenly across all shards and hotkey where one particular key is accessed excessively 
This could happen if a celebrity user's posts are all stored in one partition, as a large amount of users will keep requesting those posts, which would overload that one particular node. This is something companies like Facebook have seen and had to find solutions for. Redistribution is another one. Redistributing the data whenever adding or removing servers or changing your sharding criteria would require downtime of the system and could be a risky operation. Other problems may include denormalization. With a single database server, queries that require joins can easily be done, but as soon as you shard, you sacrifice this ease. To avoid needing to use joins on your datasets, you would have to denormalize your datasets before sharding. So as you can see, data partitioning and sharding can bring a bunch of extra complexities. Before taking the decision to shard your database, you should consider other options to make your database more performant, such as indexing or caching. But if you still decide on designing a distributed database system, there are other trade-offs that you need to consider, which I cover in a CAP theorem video. And that's all for sharding. As always, if the video helped, help me help you by liking, commenting and subscribing. And I'll catch you in the next system design video.